ready for them tonight. So they're going to have fun downstairs while we're up here praising the Lord and listening to the word of God and allowing the Lord to continue to have his way. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to open in prayer tonight just to be able to start and just to have us all together in one accord. Amen. Amen. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We've come, Lord God, to bless you. Lord God, it says, come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. And we, we want to do that tonight, Lord. We want to worship you. We want to bless you. We lift our hands in the sanctuary tonight, Lord. We want to honor you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your presence. You are Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, Lord, that you are here. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Lord God, we thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, the King of glory, strong and mighty. And Lord God, we want to continue, Lord God, to live and move and have our being in you. And we just thank you, Lord God, for the promises that you've given unto us. Lord God, we thank you that the best is yet to come. Lord God, we seek you tonight. We seek your face. Lord God, we praise you. We bless you this night. Bless each one as they also join us online. We thank you, Lord God, that you are meeting every need according to your riches and glory. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We just bless the Lord tonight. He loves it when we praise him. And the angels love it when they hear us praising him. Amen. Hark the Herald Angels.
going to go on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain. We're on the mountain of Paladin, right, tonight. So we want to continue to be the messengers of Jesus as we go and tell the world about Jesus. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain. and here of Caledon, and we just want to continue to sing out the praises of the Lord. Amen. We just want him to be declared and decreed and that the Lord reigns and he is over all the earth. Amen. Amen. We just thank the Lord. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. The government's upon his shoulders. Amen. He's the Prince of Peace in the midst of a chaotic world. He is the Prince of Peace. Amen. So we thank the Lord that he is with us. He's in
the King is coming. Lord God, you are coming, and you have been saying to us that you are coming. You are coming. You are coming, and we don't want to miss your coming. Lord God, we want to be ready. Lord God, we want to be in position. Lord God, we want to be able to know and to hear and to see you, Lord God, when you come. That we would be ready, Lord God. That we would, Lord God, be clothed in your glory and your splendor, Lord. Jesus, that your holiness, that we would be holy as you are holy. Because only are we holy in you, Lord. It's your righteousness. Oh, we want to stay close to you, Jesus. That we'll be ready. That we'll be ready. Washed in him. 
trust in you and all things, Lord. Lord, we thank you that tonight that you are meeting every need tonight according to your riches in glory, Lord God. And we pray for those tonight, Lord God, that are sick, that are not feeling well, Lord. I know some have had headaches and sinus congestion and coughs, Lord God, and Lord, and neck pain, Lord God. We just pray for your healing virtue to manifest in each and every body now in Jesus' name, every physical body to be made whole that we know about here in the family of Jehovah Jireh Christian Ministries. Lord God, we think of Mrs. DeVries and her family, Lord God. Lord God, we think of the McClellan family, Lord God, as for Rhea, Lord God, and Lord, for Mira and Noah, for Lord God, for all the congestion to be healed and dried up and all infection to be gone in Jesus' name, Lord God, every symptom, Lord, the source of the symptom, Lord God, we're asking for the fire, Lord, of your Holy Spirit, the, the, the cleansing fire that would burn up all the germs, burn up all the virus, the bacteria, whatever it is, oh God, to cleanse and to heal and to make whole. Lord, by your spirit, Lord, with your fire, with your water, with your Holy Spirit, with your blood, Lord Jesus. Lord God, you are the wonder-working miracle worker, Lord God. You are our healer. You are our health. Lord God, we continue to lift up Apostle Carol. We continue to lift up each and every one in the leadership. Lord God, each and every person, Lord, in the body of Christ, that, Lord God, we would be healthy, that we would be whole, for this is your will. This is your good and perfect will for us, for we are hidden in Christ Jesus. You, oh God, we thank you that you even sang, you know, risen with healing in your wings, the son of righteousness. Lord God, we are your children. We thank you, Lord, for healing. Lord, is the children's bread. We thank you, Lord, you heal. We thank you, Lord, you deliver. We thank you, Lord, we're hidden in Christ. We thank you we're covered in the blood. We thank you that we live in the spirit. We thank you, Lord, you're quickening. You're giving life to these mortal bodies. Resurrection life, resurrection power is at work in us. And, Lord God, we want to see it manifest. Lord God, we want to live in it. Lord God, we want to abide. We want to abide. We, Lord God, want to remain in you in our thoughts our emotions spirit soul and body lord god that we will be one with you lord god and we declare tonight that no weapon formed against us shall prosper lord god we know the weapons they are formed but we shall say they will not prosper they may come against us but they will not prosper. They will not accomplish what they have been set out to do, for they will be thwarted. They will be pushed back. For, Lord, you are our rear guard. You are our buckler. You are our shield. Your faith, your faith is our shield. Lord God, we thank you for the armor. We thank you for the breastplate. We thank you that you are our rear guard. We thank you, Lord, you surround us. Lord God, you even us clothe us. Lord, you give our feet even. You even make something for our feet and for our head, our, the helmet of salvation. None of us, oh God, every part, oh God, is covered, is protected by you. Our armor is you. Oh, you are our armor. It's your armor, Lord God. And we thank you tonight. And Lord God, we decree it and we declare it in Jesus' name. Lord, into the heavenlies, into the atmosphere, we declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord of our spirits, Lord of our souls, and Lord of our bodies. And our bodies shall exemplify the glory of the Lord, the healing of the Lord, the deliverance of the Lord, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare it this night, Lord God. For, Lord God, we will give what we receive. Lord God, we'll be givers of life as we are receiving you and living in you. We will give what we have received. And we thank you for your healing and your deliverance tonight. For each and every one, Lord God, for we cry out and you hear the cry of your people and the prayers of the righteous. Lord God, the effective prayers, they avail much. So we thank you, Lord God, as we pray according to your word. And according to your will, it shall be in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. He is good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord.
Great is the Lord. Amen. Greatly to be praised. Our God reigns. Our God rules. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord God Almighty, your banner over us is love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lift up your voices and shout unto the Lord and make a joyful noise unto our God. For he reigns and he rules. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo, Jesus. Woo, Jesus. <laughs> Whoa. Glory be to God. <laughs> Whoa, we give him praise and honor and glory. Hallelujah. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing that's impossible with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. All things are possible, right? All things are possible with God. And we give him praise and honor and glory. For he is the miracle-working God. And he is the one that has said that his favor is upon us. And he is the one who has said, I have met every need of yours according to my riches and glory. Amen. And so we are rich. Amen. Let the poor say, I am rich. Come on. And let the weak say, I am strong. Because the Lord is the one who lives inside of us. Amen. We are his living sanctuaries. And we praise him and thank him for everything that he is doing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are you ready to sow tonight? We're going to be able to sow in the kingdom of God. I know Pastor Jeff, uh, Jen, what she ended up saying is, you know, she had all kinds of scriptures as she was even praying. You know, the house is rich and full with the word. And I just thank the Lord that he is the word and he is the light. Amen. Amen. And whom shall we fear? You know, this is it. We reverence the Lord. We love the Lord because he first loved us. And he is the one who has truly blessed us in this house. And, and um, just as Jennifer even prayed for you know, the McLennan family, for them to be well. I guess Priscilla as well. I haven't heard whether or not she, how her surgery went um, and that. But anyways, we just continue to bless her in Jesus' name. And we just continue to pray strength and healing in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus is our healer. By his stripes we are healed, but we all know it takes some time, time for it to manifest, doesn't it? But we do know that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, we are healed. And we thank him. And that's why we thank him for our healing till it manifests. Amen. We just know that it shall manifest <laughs> to the glory of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let's just pray. So, Father, we just thank you again, Lord God, that we can give tonight. We just do it joyfully, Lord. We love a cheerful giver, Lord. And, uh, Lord, you just want us just to give freely, out of joy, not out of compulsiveness. Lord, not out of feeling that one has to. But that, Lord, just because we want to, it's a way in which that we just say, thank you, Lord. It comes from a heart of gratitude. And, uh, Lord, we just honor you and thank you how you have blessed us and how you have heard our prayers. and that your presence is even here with us. And so we just thank you that, Lord, that we as your children, that, Lord, we're making room for you. Lord God, so you can write your story just like that song says because you have a story for each one of us that you in heaven these books, Lord God. And, and Lord, we want to fulfill everything of the books that you have written about us. And to fulfill the story in which that, Lord Jesus Christ, you paid the price for us. As we just continue to rejoice at this wonderful time of the year. And that, Lord, that we can just continue, Lord God, to make it known that Jesus Christ is alive. That he has come. And that, Lord, that you will help us, each and every one of us. That we won't be like the innkeeper who said, I don't have room for you. But that, Lord, that we will be like the shepherds and be like the magi. 
that, Lord, that we will just be like others, that, Lord God, that, that wanted to come and wanted to sit at the feet of yours, Jesus, to make room, to take the time, to leave, drop everything, and just to worship you. And, Lord, we just thank you that we have put our trust in you because we that trust you, we don't have to be afraid because we thank you, Lord, for your peace that you've given us. And so, Lord, as people sow tonight out of great joy and thanksgiving, may you bless it, may you multiply it. In the mighty name of Jesus, may every bill be paid. Lord, uh, mortgage paid. Car payments paid, insurance is paid. Uh, Father, you know, credit cards paid. Lord, everything, every bill that we have, electrical, Lord, water bill, taxes. Lord, Lord, we just call them paid in Jesus' name because, Lord, you are our provider. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's give him praise as we sow tonight and watch and see the miracle hand of the Lord. Amen. God bless you, for we are rising and building in this house in Jesus' name. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive the King. Let every heart be filled in room. 
oh, come, let us adore him. Amen. Hallelujah. We adore you, Lord. Wow. That you first loved us. We thank you and we praise you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, God, that we can, Lord God, sing unto the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Pastor Ted, are you ready for to come and to deliver the message tonight? We just thank the Lord that Pastor Ted, he's been speaking Wednesday night. He's been speaking on the Lamb's wife. And we just thank the Lord that um, we are his wife. Amen. We are betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And we just thank the Lord that, that we have made room for him. Amen. And uh, so that he can just continue to do the work in our heart. We just know that there can be still areas in our heart that without us realizing it. Um, and God is doing such a deep work in all of our lives right now that he's taking out every weed, every tear, whatever you want to call it. But it's an area on that he's taking out of our hearts, taking it completely out, delivering us and completely setting us free. Because he's wanting us to be able to having done all to stand, to have the armor on, what Pastor Jenna said. But even for us, as we enter into 2024, even though in the Jewish calendar we're already in the move of God, of the open doors, as we've been saying for the last couple months here. And we just thank the Lord for everything that he is doing. Amen. But we know we have to war at the threshold. And we praise God, but we as being the Lamb's wife, redeemed with the blood, we know then that God is with us and for us. So we know that no weapon formed against us will prosper and that we as God's people, we will be able to get across that threshold and we will go through because we believe it's a double door season. Amen. To the glory of God. It just isn't a single door. It's the double doors. And we just praise God that we will having done all, to stand. Come on. That's what we're going to have to do because there's a battle going on to get through those doors. But we praise God. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil's defeated and he's underneath our feet in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless all you that are online tonight. Thank you for sowing as well. We just love you. God bless you. I just want to say, too, just remember, everybody, there's no intercession here on Friday, okay? And, uh, but we will be here on Sunday as we will have our Christmas Eve service here in the morning, and we praise God for that. Amen? Glory be to God. Okay. Uh, Pastor Ted, we just welcome you in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, hon. Amen. Good evening, everyone. On a wonderful evening on Wednesday in Caledon, Ontario. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> Amen. Just to be together. Well, as Pastor Carol said, we've been looking at the subject, the Lamb's Wife. And you might recall, we will just kind of move along. But we talked about when John, the Revelator, the Apostle John, the Beloved, saw the vision. And he heard the angel say to him, come and I will show you the wife of the lamb. And uh, we know who the lamb is because earlier in the same book of Revelation, it said that John looked behind and behold, he saw a lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. We know he quote that also in the, for the, his own book, the gospel of John as well. When John the Baptist saw the Jesus approaching him, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of of the world. How many are so glad that our God is an ultimate person who loves us so much that he has handled our sin? And we're going to venture into that a little bit tonight as well, some more. And uh, we are going to just look at Deuteronomy 6, 4, the importance right from the beginning. When we're looking at this broad subject about marriage even, because we've said that, uh, well, we're called the wife of the Lamb. The Bible also calls us a bride, and we looked at the language in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, and it really affirms that we, his people, we are kind of addressed as 
having a married relationship with our God. We found out the Bible says that he is married to us. He was married to the nation of Israel, and he is married to us. We are betrothed to him. That's a good thing, amen? amen. In Deuteronomy 6.4, we kind of emphasize the Bible is there. It talks about that the Lord, our God, that's the Shema, the prayer that the Israelites say to this very day. Behold, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. The Lord, our God, is one. Say with me, one. Now, often we know that that is monotheistic, means there's only but one individual God. However, we know that we've talked about how awesome it is who our God really truly is. He's multifaceted. We know in the beginning, says, let us, the pluralism, when they created the world. Jesus said that I've always been with the Father, and you see me, you know the Father. Isn't that awesome? We can't describe the Holy Trinity, but we know that the three are one. And therefore, we are acknowledging that one also means unity. See, God is never outside himself. He never works outside his own will. How many know he is all love? God is love, but God is mercy, and God is also a judge. He's sovereign. He has all authority. He's all these things. His mercy is never greater than his judgment. And his judgment's never lesser than his mercy. For us, it's kind of hard to understand that, but he in, he in his entirety, he is always, always one. And we declare that he is but one. However, we understand in Scripture, it means that there is no shadow of turning within him, meaning he changes not. His will is the same as it was way back then, today, and will be forevermore. He changes not. In his sovereignty, in his authority, in his wisdom and his love, they all work together in harmony. No wonder he says how lovely it is when the brethren dwell together. It's perfect. It's like this harmony, this beautiful joining together. We know Paul the Apostle kept over and over and says there is but one body. How many know we are one in him? And we're going to look at that. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, the very beginning of the beginnings. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. There's a picture of the Bible there. And so you can read right off what the Scripture says if you kind of look at it. Verse 24, it says, Therefore, King James, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Interesting. Behold, the Lord your God is one. A man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one. You know, from the very beginning of creation, we know the story where, you know, Eve came into the picture and, and, and Adam looked and said, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The intentions from the very beginning was the two shall be one. They would walk together in harmony, in unity. I know that's really hard for us to understand, isn't it? <laughs> we can hardly get along with our own spouse sometimes, not alone our children, our mother, our father. We can go on our boss. Our neighbor, just one another in the body of Christ even. I didn't say that, did I? We're to be one. <laughs> so there's this beautiful picture of perfect unity at the beginning, but we all know that what happened? Sin. Sin broke it. Immediately you see the disjointedness when Adam points and says to God, it's this woman that you gave me that caused me to sin. When we call that the transferring, the blame game. Right away. Uh-huh, and we haven't stopped to this very day. God, it's because of this. It's because you know that. No, it's because, right? but we know how important it is to be one. So we know the picture about this marriage relationship. It was perfect at the beginning, 
right? <laughs> One flesh communicates a unity that covers every facet of a couple's joint lives as husband and wife. In a marriage, the two whole lives unite together as one emotionally, intellectually, financially, spiritually, and every other way. Everyone say, wow. <laughs> we all have some work, don't we? <laughs> we know that it hasn't been perfect because since the fall of humankind, marriage relation has failed to measure up to the God-intended idea. That's what we're saying. Uh, but as we're looking at the Bible, we begin to realize God has created this, we're, we're to have relationship because he's a relational God, amen? You know, I know many times as uh, evangelical charismatics, we say, I'm not religious, I just have a relationship with my God. Sometimes the people in the world look at us and go, I thought being religious was a good thing because in their mind, I mean, you go to church, you obey God, you're, you know, a person of faith. I know evangelicals, we think it, it's when we do anything outside of relationship with God, meaning you come to church, and you go home, and you're never anything different. <laughs> People may look at you, and they don't see anything different than themselves. Yet, we're to be his disciples, and the only way they're going to know we're a disciple is that we can show forth the love of God through us. Amen? And so that's the big picture. It's been broken. Now, we talked how marriage, God put marriage here for us to understand how our relationship is to be to Him, right? And so we see the ideal thing about relationship. Do you think God's given up on that? No. And so He is predestined, He has called us, what? So that we would be what? Come His. And as Paul says, let the same mind that was in Christ Jesus be in you also. And be holy, Peter said, be holy as he is holy. Just say, wow. Well, is it impossible? No. But how many know <clears throat> he is married to us and he's a covenant-keeping God? And we looked at covenant. We looked at the nature of covenants. We looked at the very first covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And what we declared about that it's that we understood that back then, you know, when there was a covenant, there was a passing through the parts of the sacrifice and everything. But Abraham had the vision when God put him in a deep sleep. And we found out that God had a solitary action. I mean, he was alone. It wasn't with Abraham. God was alone, which indicates that the covenant is principally his promise. God did it. For us, God did it for Abraham. He binds himself to the covenant. So when Abraham awoke, he was like, God didn't ask Abraham to go through. God, he alone declared. That's why we've looked at the verbiage, the language. When God made the promises, you remember the five I wills? I will do this. I will bless you. I will multiply you. All the wills. How many know when you're on a wedding and they say, well, will you take so and so? He's still that covenant relationship. And you're supposed to say, I will. It's your, your life giving a promise, a covenant. And I know today that's not really understood in our society too much, is it? Covenants can be so easily broken. But thank goodness he does not break covenant. And we see that when we go through this Old Testament story with Israel. And we'll hit that a little bit tonight, a little bit more. But I just want to, we're just kind of reiterating some of the stuff we've gone through. But remember we said, regardless what Israel was doing, he said, I am married to you. Even though they went into what we deemed as a prostitute. He called the Asian, a, a nation of Israel a prostitute. Remember we talked about when Paul in the New Testament, he was declaring to the Corinthians, he says, I have given you but to one husband that you will be presented as a pure virgin. I mean, oh, we're tainted. We're not pure. But the Bible says he's looking for that bride that is spotless and without wrinkle. Everyone said amen. 
Well, we're coming into the Christmas season, aren't we? And so tonight we're just going to venture into this way, continuing with it. What else more appropriate than to look at the story of Jesus' birth a bit? Now, I want to talk about two individuals specifically, a gentleman by the name of Joseph and a young maiden by the name of Mary. And we look at that story and we can just recap it in our minds. It's so well we know that what took place is that the angel of the Lord visited Mary, all right, and declared what was going to happen to her, that she would be, she's been chosen. Now, pretty mind-blowing, but Mary sinks it in eventually. And we look, we're going to look at her song a little bit at the end. But she realizes how significant this is. Now, she didn't say too much to anyone, did she? And the story goes along and says, and that she was betrothed to Joseph. Now, remember we said in the Jewish culture, once you're at that stage, you're considered married or called husband and wife. Just no privileges yet. Kind of like what it should be today when you're engaged. It's, we say all the responsibility, but <clears throat> none of the privileges yet, guys. Right? Again, the society doesn't quite get that today. But if we understand when you're saving yourself for one another and you get what we call engaged, and you're supposed to be on that journey together. From that fo point forward, you are moving towards your entire lives together. And that's the way a betrothal was even in the Jewish culture. A covenant already was made between probably different parties, mostly the parents. And there was the, the, the wine that was brought out that was given to the bride from the, the father of the groom, and they made a covenant with wine. And if she drank from that cup, the young man was happy. It was a covenant. Say covenant. They are going to be married, or we would say, I am now a husband, and she's a wife. Though the marriage is not yet consummated, meaning they have not come and to live together in a single dwelling, their home. And this is where Joseph was moving around. He, Mary was betrothed. And we find out, don't we, that he gets the knowledge that she's pregnant, yet he has not known her. Okay? So everyone, we know in the storyline, i like to just see this little storyline tonight, because hats off to Joseph. Hey, guys, you got to look at Joseph. You got to give him a little bit of credit. Now, he was, the Bible, uh, you know, depicts him as a righteous man. He knows the law. You can go read the story. I'm just reiterating it here. And he finds out what comes to his mind. Oh, my goodness. If he, was just, if he wanted to, he could go out and herald it, call her. But she, what? Was unfaithful? She's carrying somebody else's child, yet she was basically his wife. She's called his wife. And according to the Mosaic law, she would have been stoned. Mm hmm No wonder it says, and he was going to quietly divorce her. Now, remember we talked about, it's a covenant agreement forever and ever. Say, you know, until death do we part. That's what we even say today, right? Now, the aspect of the same thing was in those days, but yeah, divorce was happening because, well, we're not living up to the standards that God first meant. But in this case, this is what was happening. He, in his mind, she was unfaithful. And he had every right to divorce her. And his mind was that I would do so quietly. Now, isn't that something to show something about him? Because he didn't want her to come underneath really harsh treatment. Somehow he was hoping that I can maybe disclose this, but, you know, in a very tight, small circle. But thank goodness, the story goes on that an angel visited Joseph as well and explained everything and said, take Mary as your wife. And it says after he had that vision, he got up and he took 
Mary into his house. But, in a little line at the very end, and in King James, he had, but he did not know her. That doesn't mean that he despised and lived in the opposite side of the corner. It just means their marriage wasn't consummated. He did not know her sexually. Interesting, he could have. But they understood because the, the, through the whole verbiage of the whole story, it's called the Holy One. To marry the angel said, it's the Holy One within you. Say holy. Joseph was told who this was, the Savior of the world, Christ the Lord, who takes away the sin. Huh. He probably thought, my wife's the temple of God. Well, she was. It was God inside her. And according to the Jewish custom, they could not defile the temple of God. We won't talk about what happened to you if you defiled the temple of God. And so he, probably that was, I'm just Ted McLean speaking here. He doesn't say that. I'm just thinking. Because it says he did not consummate the marriage. But we know after, yes, Jesus had brothers and sisters. <laughs> we know they eventually did. But the scripture was that unto us a son is given, Right? A child is born. Born of what? Born of a virgin. Conceived of a virgin and born of a virgin. So he did not know her until Jesus was born. Right? I'm Joseph. Oh, he's no longer in the temple. <laughs> Yay, right? Come on, guys. You can have a little fun here, right? <laughs> Well, he was in the temple, <laughs> no touch. Well, now he's no longer in the temple. Yay. So we know that Jesus had siblings. So why do I speak of all that? Because of the relationship that was there. What a unique couple. What a good story about marriage. He loved her. Even when he thought she had did something terrible, he loved her to make sure that he didn't want any harm to come to her. But praise God, he was a man who listened to the voice of God. Amen? And he did fulfill. He was a righteous man. And the story goes along that we know that God desires us. Remember, he calls us precious, right? First Peter 2. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. We can all oh, those great titles, but at the very end it says, and you are my special possession. Say special. And you know, that sounds like to me like love letter. <laughs> it's like God's, you know, you're in, you know, you're writing someone, you're special to me. All right. Ladies, you get a gentleman that says, I'm you're special to me. <laughs> a heart, right? And that's what God the Father says to us. You are my special and what? Possession. Hey, I own you. You're mine. <laughs> like Solomon says, I am my beloved's and he is mine. This is the relationship that was happening. Now, there's a whole lot in the book of Ezekiel, but I just want to look at a few verses. Ezekiel chapter 16 now, you read all that, you begin to realize everything that God, how he views his relationship with Israel from the very beginning and how they even fall. He calls them a harlot, a prostitute. Uh-huh. You're supposed to be married to me, and you've gone out and prostituted yourself and names all the areas of the prostitution. We're not going all into that. But we want to look into around verse 8. So Ezekiel 16. Verse 8, we also have it there, but I'm going to just do a little bit of maybe more context than I have in the slide for you. I'm going to start at verse 6. You know, he's talking about, he sees about the birthing of Israel. And then I pass, and it's all the imagery, right, of that covenant relationship that he has with them. Then I passed by, and I saw you kicking about in your blood, and as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live and I made you grow like a plant of the field, and you grew 
and developed and entered puberty, and your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you, I saw that you were old enough for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath. See what's developing here? I gave you my solemn oath and entered into, say with me, a covenant. Ah, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. <laughs> you became, you are mine. That's why over and over, many prophets talked about when they would talk, you know, the Lord, when he was speaking to them, he would say, why, you as my wife, have you done this? Why have you prostituted yourself? And the imagery through the whole New Old Testament, on the aspect, it says, the Lord your husband, I am the Lord your husband. The, the imagery is there for us to understand that he is married to us. He was married to us, I'll say, today, because, you know, just moving right along, we want to understand that from the foundations of the world, he had this plan. Long before there was the nation Israel even spoken of, God created that the two shall become. The idea of oneness is there for us to understand that it's about unity. We're to be one in him. And that's how many know that the Bible speaks about his love for us is inseparable. Say with me, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Even when your mind is not with him, your heart is far, and you are not even thinking of him, he still loves you. He loved you, Paul said, even before you even acknowledged him to be Lord of your life. Thank goodness. Hence, the most famous scripture verse that we can herald out this season is, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. Hallelujah. The key word, love. The greatest of these is love. Corinthians says in 13. John 17, when Jesus speaks about his relationship and our relationship, and he says, Father, I wish that they would be one as we are one. Wow. He says, when we become one here, I'm talking about us, the world will know that he is Lord. You see, when we're not really coming into unity together as the body of Christ, we're not displaying the nature of God. Because, see, God is not any part of double standard or disunity. Whenever a husband and wife are, you know, not walking in unity, it's not displaying God's love. So, you know, the word admonishes, don't go, ang don't go to bed angry. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom to that. Thank you. For that in the word of God for us, amen. Isaiah 42. Because God had the big picture from the very beginning before even Israel was in existence. When Israel came in existence, we talked about that star with Abraham, the covenant. And that covenant remains. Well, here we are today. Well, beloved, you're called drafted in. <laughs> We've inherited what was spoken to Israel. Israel is not finished, nor are you. But guess what? It's not about Israel or us because there's neither Jew or Greek or male or female in the body of Christ. The bride is all. That's why when John, the revelator, he saw when it says, now come and I'll show you the bride, the new Jerusalem, then it was coming down, and we remember we talked about at the bottom of the foundations is written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, of course, of course, it's Jerusalem. No, wait a second. But also on the foundation are the 12 names of the apostles. You see, we see this beautiful picture of the old and the new become together because we come right to that story when Jesus walked here on earth and he was in that upper room and he held that cup. Huh? The cup? 
Remember the cup makes a covenant? And he declared this is the establishment of the new covenant. Because the picture was from day one, we are to be one with our God. You know, in the Old Testament, he says, I don't desire sacrifice. I don't care about all these. What he really wants is, was the heart. And it was promised that one day his word would be written where? Upon our hearts, not tablets of stone. You see, the externalness, religious people, right? Religious and the charismatic. And oh, the religious, the externalness is important. And to God, it's not. Well, the word says thus and thus and thus, and Jesus counterdicted a lot. Yeah, you say that, but I say unto you, anyone who so looks at a woman in lust in his heart has committed adultery. Oh, gee, from the external to <laughs> the inter- what's in here, inside. You know, you, you think a vengeance should be this, and you can have retribution for that, and you can have the right to be angry, but he says, anyone who says that, you sin against me, because he talks about what's in the heart. That's where you want to know where you are. Well, Jesus says where your heart is there, so is your treasure. What's important to us? What are we married to? Things, the world, the opinions, the social media, politics, whatever, wealth. Of course, we know that Jesus said anyone who puts any of those things up and above me can't have any part of me unless you deny yourself. Even yourself, you can't have any part of him. You become his entirely. Wow. Isaiah 46, 2 made a promise to them, though, to Israel. He says, I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. They were to be a light To the nations. He chose a people. Now, where did it come from? Nothing unique. Like, he called Abraham out of, like, Abraham knew nothing about God. But he called him out. And we know the story develops to where there is a people called the nation of Israel. And the promises and the covenant was repeated over and over And over again, wasn't it? But God never breaks it. But he wants his people to come into relationship. And the desire for him to have a people was that they would be a light. Well, guess what? John talks about that light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And it says that, and that Word is a light to the world. How many know that in the Gospels, Jesus gave me, you know, that we are to what? Be the same. That we are to be a light. Israelites are to be a light. We're to be a light. They're to see us. A lot of people think then, well, it's the glory of God. The glory of God, the key to the glory rests on love. You are absent of love, you do not have glory. You can have all the gifts. Paul said they're without calling. Miss, pardon me. They're without repentance. Excuse me, everyone. They're without repent. What does that mean? It's it's God. God gives good gifts. It's God who is the giver of gifts. Your heart, however, is your will for Him, and He desires our heart. And the only way that they're going to see that is when we love. Jesus says, to the extent that you obey me, is the extent that shows you how much you love me. I often said, you want a measuring stick of your love? Well, if you obey this much, that's how much you love him. You obey him this much, but that's how much you love him, and so on. Oh, wow. Do you love me? Peter, you're going to share the light of the gospel to those around you. Feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? He says to his bride, come on, the bridegroom, right? Do you love me? Let me hear that. Do you love me? Do you love me? Galatians 4. 
verses 4 and 5. We're going to tell them, but when the fullness of the time was come. You see, there's a time appointed when Mary was going to receive. You ever thought about that real quick? God appointed a time. He created the world. He's foreordained everything, and he created the time when his son would come, and he picks the time for his son to come when the world is upside down. Seriously. It's bad today. But I mean, I mean, for those that were in the, in the land of that time in Israel, it was agonizing because they were taken over. They really didn't have rights. Well, we complain about having our rights. They didn't have rights. Because if a, a Roman centurion came across and said, you, you pick up my whatever, they had to. No question, no ifs and no buts. Oh, yeah, they had a king called Herod. Well, let's not talk about him too much. Herod was just as worldly and ungodly. But they put him there to hope to satisfy the people that if they had a king, you know, uh, they'll like kind of feel as if they do have a will. But meanwhile, we know that <coughs> the governor that sat there really had full control from the Roman Empire. And there was turmoil. Herod was upset. He was a jealous guy. You imagine when male children were slaughtered because he feared that someone said, did you know there's a new king born of the Jews? How would you like to live back then? Huh? We think we got it bad? So I'm, I'm just, why am I saying? I'm painting a picture. God appointed that time. Oh, my goodness. Lord, could you not have been a little bit like, you know, you know the time. Ah, there's a better time to have the Son of God born. You know, right in the middle of chaos, turmoil. I mean, the air was like considered dark for them. And, of course, we know it's all mixed up. And we can talk about this for hours. How they were sought to have that political, that physical throne of David established because their freedom was going to come through the establishment of a physical throne. Hence why the John, going back to John, and his own did not even recognize him because they were totally looking for a different idea of a savior. But it says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under law, all these things, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Amen. We've been grafted in. How many know such a good thing? How many know he, that he's a covenant-keeping God? The same aspect that he declared to Abraham is ours as well. We are to be a light to the nations. We are to inherit the earth. Hallelujah. We are to be a blessing. Hallelujah. Isn't it good? You know, there's a song that first comes from Zechariah. In Luke chapter 1, 72 to 73, I got there, I found a picture. Something to sing about. You know, we know he went through quite a bit when I told that about his son. And I just want to highlight, you can read all of it, the whole part of there. But the reason why I want to read this part, it shows the covenant that's coming through, the point in time that God sent his son. It says, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. So already millennium have gone by. And they're holding on to the covenant that was spoken way back then. And he, he's fine. Like, Zechariah's like, okay, wow. God's on the move. My son's a forerunner to he who is to come to set us free. Wow. You remember your holy covenant. Wow. That which you swore way back then. The song of Mary next. Luke chapter 5, pardon me, Luke chapter 1, verses 55. You can read it. It's a beautiful song. 
again, I just want to go home into this, this verse, verse 55. Remembering in her song after everything, and she's settled in her heart. She knows that she's carrying the Son of God. She says, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. It's a promise. It's a love. The Christmas story is about a covenant-keeping God. What's the covenant about? He views us as his own. He's married to us. And he will never forsake us. He never gives up on us. You know, if you want to go to the external or the back, well, Hebrews chapter 4 really begins to talk about, you know, the relevance of the appointed time when he became the Son of God. Where John said, the Lamb of God. You know, we often think about the story, you know, we, we're going to think about Mary, Joseph, baby, Jesus, away in a manger. No crib for our bed. I love it. It's a, it's a nice hymn. But God had a reason why they went. Again, bless Joseph. He's got a wife, you know, pregnant by the Holy Spirit. He, he hasn't known her, you know, no consummation. Of the and he love him, but traveling, but he's got to go do this duty and register, right? And they go and they go this, again, lovely timing, right? You ever, you ever trying to plan a trip? You do it in advance because, you, you know, you want to avoid issues. <laughs> hey, anyone? Or, 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 oh, dear, I might get in trouble tonight. Or are there planners that wait to the last minute? <laughs> you just hope it's all going to pan out. And, you know, and you, you know, you get, and, and, and the wife looks at you, honey, and you, you know, did you not know that, you know, there's no bus from here to there? Or something? You know what I mean? Like, oops. Well, he got there, and there's no room. They're going around. The place is crowded. Everyone's there to, for the, the census. And, and, it, and here's his pregnant wife. It's a special spot. I can't spend a whole lot of time. It's part of the Christmas story, but it was a special spot. It was prophesied where he would be. Oh, yeah, a stable. No, no. A spe specific stable. Mm -hmm. A place where the shepherds are out in their fields. Yeah, that sound familiar? And there's these places they called these towers, which they looked over. Yeah, the shepherds had towers, and they looked over the flock at night. Uh huh. But there was a specific tower. I forget the name now in Hebrew. Pardon me, but it's mentioned in the Bible. And this is the one that's close to this being able to collect all the livestock to go into the temple to be sacrificed. Uh, and what they would do, this one specific spot was like kind of like you would call the royal sheep. Special shepherd, special place. And when the lamb was born, it was removed and taken and taken into the special tower where it would look at and they would say, is this without blemish? Is it without spot? Is there any deformities? Is there anything? And they, they especially pampered these lambs, washed them, mm -hmm. ceremony in a trough and kept them. I mean, like, you talk about pampered and spoiled little lambs. We won't talk why anymore, though. <laughs> but they were kept for a specific purpose. <laughs> Let's just say this way. My, my mom's got a new pup. And, of course, when we brought her home, bringing her home, she's like, oh, what's that on her tail? I was like, oh, there's something on her tail. It's not right. And I feel, oh, my goodness, yeah. It, like the, it's deformed. Like the bone, like, I mean, like, I mean, like, it's a crook. Now she's grown. I, I love her tail. You go, oh, oop. A little knobby on the end. It, more into, I don't know how it's, it, it's, it's multiple. I don't know how it's, but either something happened, it was either a birth defect or something happened when she was a pup. She was really young. We got her young, right? Or my mom got her young. 
Well, the whole family, we all got her young. Anyways, <laughs> she's in our household. Everyone's like, take care of the puppy. Okay, so anyway, she's growing, and so is that little knot in the end. No, it doesn't look bad. She's going to have lots of fur. However, when I, I was, mom was away, I took her to the vet, and of course, we're all, oh, she's got this thing, so ask the vet, you know. Like, and the vet, you know, oh, okay. And I go, well, oh, she just can't be a show dog. That was her response to me. She can't be a show dog. Why? Oh, too bad. She's got a deformity, imperfection. <laughs> Those little lambs, they couldn't have any imperfection to be sacrificed. Now, Hebrews 10, verse 4, that's where we're coming. You know, we read all that. It's talking about how Christ, you know, he's become... The first man, I mean the second Adam and the second man. And, he, and, and, and the aspect that the writer to the Hebrews was trying to say, no matter how much we sacrifice an animal, it, it's not good enough. If it was, if it, if it was good enough, if it was effectual, let's use that word, if it was effectual, then why did they have to do it again and again and again and again and again? Over and over and over. Yes, it was a reminder to them of their sin. Yes, it was a reminder that they should be consciously aware that that animal's dying for them, so they should be honoring and remembering the Lord their God. Didn't work, did it, too much. And Hebrews 10, verse 4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible. But we soon learn that the covenant-keeping God had a plan of a spotless lamb who would be given for you and I, who for once and for all, for all eternity, say all eternity, will have forgiveness of sins, but no more sacrifice of animals because Jesus Christ became the ultimate sacrifice. He who knew no sin, who was born of a virgin, who lived and walked and told everyone to be, to be ready for me always like the Twelve, like the ten virgins who are ready, right? Because the bridegroom will call out. He's calling out our names. How many know he calls out our names? For all have been called. But to be chosen is another thing. And found faithful, thirdly. Called, chosen, and faithful. You're all called. You've all been chosen. Will you be found Faithful. For he is faithful and true. He's our bridegroom. If, as we say, the lamb, if that's God, if that's the way he is, we're married to him, then what are we to be like? Like unto him. We're to be like him. We're going to close with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But whoever is united with the Lord, say with me, is one. Say one. Where did we start? About oneness. Whoever is united with the Lord is one with Him in spirit. The ultimate goal tonight, if you go home with anything, the ultimate thing about Christ's birth was to establish that relationship where we are one with Him. That was His reason to come into this world. That you and I he, would know our husband. He is one with us as he deemed that the two shall become one so he's saying to us and our relationship we become one with him it's been his desire from day one this relationship this love that he has for us is that we're going to be uniquely one in him now you're going to wake up tomorrow you're going to look in the mirror and you're going to say i am precious Well, when I get my hair all, no, no matter what you look like, come on, bride, 
You're precious to him. Well, I'm not perfect yet. No, I know. Paul even said, the more closer I get to him, even the more I see of my sin. <laughs> How many know that when we're walking with him, we're walking in this relationship that it says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank goodness, you know, we're diamonds in the rough, but he sees us as beautiful. Hey, come on. He says, in Christ you have received everything. In Christ Jesus, Ephesians, right? You've received all blessings. Say all. In Christ. <laughs> You're precious. I'm a little bit rough right now. But he looks and sees, you're a precious jewel. The new Jerusalem was gorgeous. I mean, like, wow. Read again, go back to uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. You say how he made his bride beautiful. Gave her gold and fed her well. And she was pleasing and beautiful and fine linen. He said, it talks about all the, I mean, it sounded really nice what was given to her. He takes care of us. Jesus said, even though I go to the Father, I leave with you one who what will never leave you nor forsake you. He will be your comforter. The Bible says, the one who sticks right beside you. How many know our spirits bear witness that we are born again, amen? And we are His. So when you wake up in the morning, I guess start with your spirit, man. You look at your physical man, you may be like, boy, oh boy. You may even feel, boy, oh boy, this body of mine now. I get out of bed and I, okay, and I, oh, oh, okay, get up. And after I stretch a little bit, I'm good to go. But it's like, where is that from? You know what I mean? Anyone know what I mean? Yeah, come on. Come on, if not, I'm going to visit your house tomorrow morning when you wake up and take a picture of you and send it to social media. Hey, look what Pastor Carol looks like in the morning. Ooh! That's Pastor Carol. <laughs> he loves us, amen? Despite everything, isn't he so good? So if you can take anything out of here, he's a covenant-keeping God. yes. Yes, we do not take grace for granted. We don't continue in our sin. That's what Paul says. <laughs> Shall we sin so grace then abounds? Woohoo! No, it says grace becomes your master. No longer sin, but grace is your master. And you read on Ephesians where it says that we received everything in Christ, but when he talks about lordship, he's talking about you dealing now with the issues of the heart. Because he wants your heart, amen? Oh, he's such a good God. How many know he's compelling us and he's loving us? Yeah, we could talk about love, couldn't we? I said I was closing. <laughs> well, the, odd, the truth is he disciplines those whom he loves. Oh, come on. Could we could not keep it warm and fuzzy and leave out, you know? But he does because how many know he is not going to leave you? I think of anything we can learn tonight and the Christmas. He's not going to leave you. Ever heard the expression, married to the backslider? He's not going to leave you. Oh, I don't believe in that no more. I don't know that, sir. Or we allow unforgiveness to remain in our heart. Or we leave the church because of, you know, petty differences and offenses and all these things that is tr troubling the body of Christ. But guess what? He's there. Corey Tim Boom said, quoted, you know, even though I go to the very, very depths of hell, he's there. You know, if you, even if you take yourself on a journey for we have all gone astray, right? Sometimes we stray farther than we need to. Sometimes we stray too far. Pastor Carol's always worried where her little puppy is. My big dog, he roams the 15 acres. And she's so afraid that my Lonnie's big brother is going to take her. Yeah. 
she's, she's away, she's going to stray too far. But how many know that the Lord is our shepherd? He takes care of us. His rod and that staff, it comforts us. Lo Lonnie doesn't need it. If anyone who, Lonnie, Lonnie's the puppy. <laughs> Kai is the big guy, which Kai is for, help me, my wife. It's the ocean, Hawaiian for ocean. Lonnie's for heaven, for sky. Yeah, we got Lonnie and Kai. Anyways, I don't know where I'm going with that. Shall be an interesting relationship. Anyways, how many know that we're not to go astray because he's desiring for us <laughs> to come back into the fold. It was a pray. Lord, we thank you for this night. We thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you for your tender mercies, Lord God. We thank you that you are a God who loves us oh, better than we know, Lord, Father. Because, Lord, we can't even comprehend how great your love is for us. But behold, how great his love. It's like a banner over us. It's love. He surrounds us with his love. He dances over us with exceedingly great joy. We, he calls us his own. And I thank you, Lord, the Father, though the, sometimes, Lord, we wander. I thank you that you are holding and you're calling us back. Lord, we pray for those, the prodigals, Lord, that they will come home in the name of Jesus because you are a Father who loves them. We pray, Father, at this Christmas season for those who are afraid to go into their homes or come into family because of the discord or, or, or father the dysfunctionality whatever you want to say lord we pray for those that are in christ jesus they would realize that greater is he that is in him than anything else that is in the world for your love casts out all fear we thank you lord that you are a great loving god and your love shall conquer and complete everything in us we're so thankful father that it's not our work originally it does not originate in us but you have given us the ability to be made more than conquerors in you and we give you the glory and we give you the honor and we give you the praise in jesus wonderful name and everyone in agreement says amen and amen the lord bless you as you've been watching online with us as well and uh we look forward to the this sunday as we'll be Actually, Christmas Eve, Sunday. Awesome. We don't get that often. I forget how long it takes around to come, but we'll be looking forward to that. But then following Wednesday, no service here, no time um, given, but we'll be looking forward to, again, then next following Sunday, New Year's Eve. Woo! Praise God. So anyways, Lord bless you. Until then, in Jesus' name.